Well, good evening, church. It's uh, good to be with you on another beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Uh, my prayer is that uh, each and every one of you were, were able to enjoy the warmth and the sunshine today uh, and uh, just praise the Lord for it. You know, He gives us these things and, and we're just uh, so blessed to, to receive that. So blessed to have that uh, um, warmth, that uh, sunshine. Uh, and a uh, beautiful day that God has given us. Uh, tonight, we just, uh, we're going to be in the third chapter of the book of John. Uh, first eight verses we're going to try to cover. And prayerfully, each of you, uh, you know, have been, been reading this on your own. Uh, I ask you to, if you don't have your Bibles ready, go ahead and get them here and, and be prepared. But there's, uh, before we go and, and get into the lesson, we want to, uh, pray, and we've got a lot of people to pray for tonight. Just uh, there's just so many. We need to pray for our nation. Pray that uh, that we as a people would understand the great need for Jesus. Uh, that we as a people would understand that those of us that are called by His name, that uh, as it says in in Chronicles uh, uh, seven fourteen, it says uh, that we that uh, that are called by his name should humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and he said then would he hear from heaven then would he heal our lands uh and you know we're looking around in, in the world and, and thinking that the healing is going to come from something political or the healing is going to come from uh some sort of shot the healing is going to come from god's children uh, humbling themselves before him and seeking him above everything else and us doing the things that he's called us to do. Uh, years ago, and, and you, I may have said this before, but um, I was thinking about, you know, all the issues going on and, you know, you're thinking about the people that are out in drugs and alcohol and, you know, living sinful lives and, and all those various things. And, um, and as I was reading that scripture, it was just as God spoke to me, you think about how that the the changing of the world the 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 getting all of the things back in order is all based upon those folks but it's in reality it's based upon god's children acting like god's children seeking god's will following his commandments and being the light of the world because that's what's going to draw people i uh, do continue to pray for uh, our friend that we mentioned the other night, Dewey Brown, he is uh, home from uh, the hospital, and, and Dewey is a pastor, and, and uh, with uh, having blood clots in his lungs, uh, those uh, those would make it uh, kind of difficult for him to speak right now and, and to preach, and so don't know how long he'll be laid up, but uh, do pray for him and his family. The, the doctors said, you know, he's on the road to recovery, but it could take quite some time. Uh, pray for Wayne Barb, pray for Wayne Teeth Taylor as they continue to try to, to heal. I uh, ask you to continue to remember our cousin, uh, Lynn. He was uh, uh, just got uh, home from the hospital this afternoon and uh, just uh, needing a miracle from the Lord. You know, he's uh, needing either the Lord to supernaturally heal his liver or to see fit to allow him to get a liver transplant. Remember uh, Brenda, the mom of uh, Bev, Shannon, and Christy, my dear cousins, uh, as uh, she's battling uh, lung cancer and as they're taking care of her. I know that uh, these young ladies, they, uh, and I call them young ladies because they're my cousins and they're just a little bit younger than me, but they're young ladies. So uh, as they take care of their, uh, their mother, that uh, they would enjoy the days they have and realize that only the Lord knows how long it is. And uh, he'll be with them every step of the way. Pray for uh, the church as we prepare to open up the food pantry. It is such an abundance of food there that, uh, but if we think about the number of people in our community and in our area that, uh, that are hungry, I read some statistics this past week, don't know how accurate they are for the general vicinity around our area, but saying there could be as many as, you know, uh, one third of the children go to bed hungry at night because of the fact of the, the lack of nutritious food in the household. So 
I know that uh, the, from the donations of everybody, from the hard work of uh, Chris and Catherine and, and others, that uh, there's good nutritious food there to be distributed as a needs. And then also the following week, we'll be having our food box distribution uh, from the Super Bowl. There is enough food there to create 120 boxes, and those boxes are, if you even when they're created, are they said that they will feed a family of four for two days, uh, and uh, there, you know, that's from the abundance of the funds that came in through during our Super Bowl. Uh, it was a joy on Monday night to see all the youth there unloading that truck uh, they made short order of it so that us older folks didn't have to do much of anything other than stay out of the way uh, but it was a joy to see the young young men and women there uh, working for the Lord so a lot of stuff going on continue to pray for our discipleship classes continue to pray for decisions and moving forward uh, as these numbers continue to seem to get better all the time or, or remaining lower than they have been for quite some time, uh, we need to be thinking about and praying about moving forward. Easter will be here in about five weeks, and we'd love to be able to uh, uh, have people together there on Easter and, and just have a celebration. So let's be praying and see how that God would see fit to allow us to do that. Uh, pray for I uh, ask you to continue to pray for me. Uh, on Friday, I'll have my knee surgery. Uh, don't expect it to be a very serious thing, but I will be missing this Sunday. So uh, pray for Randy's story. He'll be bringing the message Sunday morning. And for Jerry Delosier, he'll be uh, bringing the, the teaching on Sunday night. And I know they'll do a wonderful job. So I ask you to pray for them, support them, be out there. Uh, and let them know that uh, that we love them. So we're going to pray and get right on into the uh, scripture tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, again for the beautiful, beautiful day. Lord, as we've been outside and, and enjoying the warmth and the beauty of all that you've created and realizing, Father, that, uh, God, this is just another gift that you've given us. And Lord, for just uh, we just want to praise you for... Uh, loving us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And Father, as we open the word tonight and as we begin to read, God, how that Christ instructed Nicodemus, Father, let us hear what he's instructing us. God, what your word says to us, what your spirit says to us. And Father, let us realize that we must be about our father's business. And God, that we must be doers and not hearers only. Again, Father, I pray that you be with all these that we mentioned earlier that are uh, sick, all of these that are battling illnesses, have had surgeries, and God, and for also the families that have lost loved ones, Lord, uh, pray for uh, Kim and, and uh, Rex uh, Matlock, Lord, uh, and uh, it just seems like that they've had such a season of loss, Lord, and I pray for them as, uh, as uh, Rex grieves the, the passing of his mother, Lord, and I know that there's so many others, God, that... Uh, if I were to mention them all, Father, I know I would miss some, but, uh, but Father, you know them all, and I pray that you just touch them and heal them and strengthen them as only you can. Father, we love you. We praise you. And all these things I'd ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, again, as I said, it's good to be with you tonight. We're in the third chapter of the book of John. Uh, as Jesus has... Uh, been at the wedding in Cana. Jesus has cleansed the temple. Jesus has uh, been in at to Jerusalem uh, for the Passover. Uh, as Jesus is doing all these things, uh, his fame is growing. Uh, they're seeing the miracles that he's performing. Uh, people are flocking to him in, in just large, large groups. And uh, and but tonight we uh, are going to be studying about. Not a large group coming, but one individual. And uh, uh, so we're going to read this and then get right on into it. John 3, verse 1. Now, when there was a man, that, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And uh, as I was reading this and, and uh, studying this this past week, uh, you know, thinking about Nicodemus, you know, it starts right off and it says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And, you know, and that doesn't give a whole lot of description of, of Nicodemus. It doesn't just, you know, it's just, well, he was a Pharisee. But as I was reading this, you know, and you see the little tag at the end of it, a ruler of the Jews, that tells us that he was even a more than just your average run-of-the-mill Pharisee. He was one that was of position, of authority. He was one that was considered, uh, I guess, in the hierarchy of the Pharisees. He was in the upper echelon of it. And it says that the Talmud, which is, you know, a historical writings of the Jewish rabbis, it's uh, uh, one of the J Jewish history books, if you would, mentioned uh, Nicodemus and said at this time that Nicodemus was the fourth richest person in Jerusalem. Now, when you consider that this was kind of the, the center of the kingdom there, that this was the center of power and authority and everything, being the tenth or the fourth richest person meant he, was, he had some uh, pretty high status. He was somebody that was probably looked up to, uh, probably, uh, it doesn't say how he obtained his wealth, uh, you know, but uh, probably was a very intelligent man. But being intelligent, being well respected, being looked up to, being a man of authority and of power, you know, is not enough. Uh, it says, it just talks about that. And I was reading, and uh, it was uh, reading a little thing, and it was talking about Benjamin Franklin. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin was one of our uh, forefathers, one of our statesmen, uh, an avid inventor, a very in uh, intelligent individual. Uh, and they said he was a very avid writer and he corresponded with a lot of people. But it talks about one of the correspondence that he had received and said probably one of the most, if not the most important from a spiritual standpoint that he would ever receive. And as I was reading through the stuff, I was trying to find, okay, does it say that he responded in a positive way to this? But it was a letter he'd received from George Whitfield, who was a, a noted theologian, preacher, pastor, uh, evangelist in, in England and in, in Great Britain at the time. And, uh, and it says, Whitfield wrote, I find that you grow more and more famous in the learned world as you have made such progress in investigating the mysteries of electricity, I now humbly urge you to give diligent heed to the mystery of the new birth. It is the most important and interesting study, and when mastered, will richly repay you for your pains. George Whitfield is saying, Ben, you're, you're learned, you're intelligent, you're doing great things with electricity. But let me tell you what you really need to be studying. Let me tell you something that is truly life-altering. I mean, probably every one of us would say, you know, we love, we love having electricity. I don't know anybody that has lived with it and lived without it that doesn't say, I like electricity. You know, we're glad that he made these discoveries. We're glad that they learned how to harness it. We're glad that, you know on down through all the years, all the inventions that have worked with it. We're glad that. But electricity is something that, as the folks down in Texas and Louisiana and some of those places just found over the last couple of weeks, is very fickle in one sense. Uh, the system can get shut down. You know, wind turbines, which they thought, oh, that will be the answer to uh, pure, clean 
constant electricity, well, they froze up. The blades wouldn't turn. It got, you know, they couldn't, so they couldn't generate any electricity. Um, solar panels, they got iced over and got covered with snow, so they weren't collecting and transferring into the battery banks to make electricity. That's something that can, but George Whitfield is telling Ben Franklin, let me tell you something here. If you study about the new birth, and if you master what Jesus is saying in this, you know, it will richly repay you. Uh, church, I'm here to tell you the same thing. Everything that we study, everything we accomplish, when we find what's written right here in these eight verses that I've just read, when we are born again, it's the greatest thing that ever happens to us. It's something that won't fail us and something that won't go away. But Nicodemus being a real, uh, you know, we'll get back to Nicodemus, but he was an intelligent, learned, powerful individual. But that's not enough. And it says, For this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus uh, coming to Jesus by night. I don't know about you, but at times, you know, I thought, why, why would Nicodemus come at night? Was he ashamed? Was he afraid? Um, why would he come at night? But in, in reading some commentaries and reading some um, history about that time, there's some other reasons. I mean, it could have been that he was sneaking in to see Jesus. Doesn't say he wasn't. Doesn't say he was. But it's also could have been the fact that during the day, the crowds were crushed in around him so much, and Nicodemus being a powerful individual, he didn't want to deal with uh, the crowds. Or it could have been for the fact that Nicodemus, being a very intellectual individual, a very learned individual, um, said one of the customs of that day was the very learned and very intellectuals in the cool of the evening gathered together in small groups uh, and got together and went to one of them's house or somewhere, and they sat and, and discussed events. You know, that was their time to, you know, sharpen their minds. That was their time to, to do these things. So, you know, it said that it could possibly have been one of those things. It could have not been that he was ashamed or afraid or uh, concerned of being seen. could have been just the fact that that was the most convenient time for him, and that was a time that he could get to Jesus. But... Also, we need to look at it and see what he is saying. You know, when, when he starts out, he says, Rabbi, which is a term of respect, teacher. So if you, if you think about how that the Pharisees had talked to Jesus up to this point, what, what the majority of them seem to think about Jesus up to this point, this kind of shows you something that Nicodemus was a little different. In the fact, he was speaking to him in, in, with a term of respect, a term of honor, uh, rabbi, teacher. Uh, you know, you're my equal, if not my better. Because when he goes on down, he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. So he's doing two things there. He is saying, I'm respecting you. And I realize that what you're doing is because you come from God. Now, he's not yet saying, I... I believe that you're the Messiah. Um, I think that possibly as he's going and investigating this, he may be looking thinking, okay, is this a one of the precursors of the Messiah? Is this like another prophet, like Elijah, except, except that Elijah first appeared, you know, the Messiah wouldn't come. So he is, you know, you're, you're beginning to wonder, okay, is he thinking of these things? And then there's another little thing that you look in this and see, it says, Rabbi, we know. So, you know, what does that tell you? Nicodemus wasn't coming just for himself. Now, was he an emissary from some curious Pharisees? Uh, that maybe, you know, because Nicodemus was such of high esteem and, and intellect and authority that he was the emissary of those other Pharisees that were curious about Jesus and went... Or was this for his personal family? You know, hey, my family, we. So it, there again, 
this is one of those things where it doesn't say, but it said, but we understand that Nicodemus didn't come just for himself. He come curious. He come undoubtedly had been speaking to, to others about Jesus. Undoubtedly had been um, looking at the things that Jesus had done. Because he says, we know for no one can do that these signs that you do unless God is with him. Uh, he had been seeing the signs, the wonders, the miracles that Jesus had done. He had been hearing about them. So, you know, Nicodemus comes straight in, um, showing respect, showing honor to him, uh, and saying, we, I'm, I'm coming on behalf of not just me, but others. And But I thought it was really interesting. You notice he didn't ask him a question. Nicodemus didn't say, uh, you know, like the rich young ruler over in Matthew 19, 16 says, And behold, a man came unto him, saying, Teacher, what deed must I do to have eternal life? He didn't come and say, you know, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Or um, are you the Messiah? Or, you know, what's your intention? He starts out just speaking to him in a term of respect and honor. But Jesus gets straight to the point. Verse 3 Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Pretty straightforward there. Jesus doesn't say, let's talk a while, Nicodemus. Let me hear your story. Let me Tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, what do you really, what do you really come for? What are you really looking for? Jesus just went straight to it and said, you got to be born again. You got to be born again. And uh, as far as I can read, this is the first time that this was ever spoken. It was ever said that way. Uh, that concept was ever brought, if you would. And so I'm sure it probably uh, just threw Nicodemus for a loop because being a Pharisee, uh, he was all about rules, all about laws, all about following instructions and things and, and do it. And uh, so he had not, you know, being born again. Now, how's this thing going to happen? And uh, I was reading, it says that the term born again in the Greek language is uh, genethia anathen, which is more aptly translated to be born from above. So, you know, even though Nicodemus, as we're going to read in the next verse, Nicodemus goes straight to the natural, the physical. The Jesus is saying, except that you be born from above. Uh, but I don't know that Nicodemus caught that, or I don't, you know, couldn't, didn't understand that, didn't understand Jesus is speaking to me in a uh, strictly spiritual sense, not just a physical sense. In so Nicodemus said back to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time <clears throat> into his mother's womb and be born? And, you know, there Nicodemus is stuck somewhat in the natural world. Um, you know, sometimes we do the very same things. We pick this book up and we begin to read things and we try to... I guess, look at them from our carnal standpoint, from our finite mind, from our, uh, from our limited understanding, when God's ways are above our ways. Uh, and sometimes we don't understand these things. Uh, one of the things that Jesus did quite often, if you'll read throughout as we read through the Gospels, he spoke in parables in um trying to bring things to a level that they can understand. But even that, so many times, he would then have to go back and explain the parables uh, and say say what each part of the parable represented so that people would begin to understand it a little better. But, Jesus, uh, but Nicodemus says, how can this be? You know, um, I understand the physical laws, he said. You know, I, I understand the things of, the, of nature, you know, what it means to be born, how you're born, you know. And, and he says, but how can it be when we're, he's old? How can we enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born again? And and uh, as a Pharisee and as a ruler of the fair in there and as a very rich, learned individual, uh, we've got to, there, I keep going back, but we have to understand the intellectual level that, that Nicodemus probably was at. 
and understand the intellectual level that the Pharisees as a group were at. Um, just a little interesting tidbit for your information, I would think. But according to the Mishnah, which is kind of the Jewish breakdown of the Pentateuch, uh, the additional rules, the additional laws, the additional uh, regulations on how to do things. Uh, when it talks about honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, you know, no work shall be done therein, the, you know, the commandment. In the uh, Mishnah, there are 24 chapters that denote what work is and how it would be that you would defile the Sabbath day and all the things that you're not to do. So if we can kind of understand, you know, Nicodemus is coming from that background. You know, uh, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you, if you've known anybody that ever come from a very, very legalistic Christian uh, background. It was uh, people were more wrapped up in the thou shall nots and in the uh, traditions and in the follow this step and this step and this step and this step as opposed to a relational uh, situation with Christ. Now, we have to follow the steps that are written in God's holy word. But sometimes we do kind of like the Pharisees. We'll take one section of scripture and then we will expand on it, and we will expound on it, and we will enlarge it to make dozens of rules that the Scripture never made. Well, Nicodemus is, is coming from that background, so he's, he's confused here. It seems like that he's trying to think natural, spiritual, and then Jesus comes right on back and answers. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, he's explaining, and you know, love that about Jesus, that he didn't leave us in the dark, uh, if we open up his word and we begin to read his word and we begin to take it in its entirety and not just little snippets of it here and there, if his word will begin to expound upon itself. You know, there's the, the most accurate form of study of scripture is that we interpret scripture using scripture. You know, you interpret the Word of God that we're studying in John, we all, we, it's comparative to the stuff that we're reading in Mark. And we bring them together and we look at them and then we see what Paul has written over in Ephesians. And we see what uh, may have been written in the Psalms or in the Proverbs or uh, in uh, Chronicles or someplace. And they all come together because the Word of God is truly a seamless story of Jesus, the seamless story of the gospel. Uh, when it gets confusing is when we try to take a little portion of it, a little piece of it from our carnal minds and like Nicodemus was doing, how is this possible? You know, as most of us guys, we think about it, okay, I'm now, you know, 10 inches, 12 inches taller than my mom and outweigh her by 100 pounds. That, that ain't happening. I'm not being born again that way. Uh, and he's saying, the fleshly birth is flesh. But he said, I'm talking about spiritual, that eternal, internal thing that is made, that is truly in the likeness of Almighty God. He said he made us a living soul. He made us a living being there. And, but Jesus says, truly, truly. And every time you'll see him say, truly, truly, uh, you know, and it's twice here in the last uh, in three verses. What does it mean? It means pay attention. Pay attention. A great truth is be getting ready to be told. A great truth is getting ready to be imparted on you. So if you read truly, truly, uh, I mean, we should pay attention to everything we read in the Bible. But, I mean, he's given, they're giving us a uh, opportunity here to 
perk up a little bit more. You know, take another sip of coffee, get your senses going, whatever you got to do. See what it says. Truly, truly, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. And, you know, as we read these things and understand, he's talking about spiritual matters. And, and when you go down to verse 7, as same as it is in verses 3 and in 5, at the beginning of verse 7, you know, it talks about singular. When Jesus is saying, I say to you, unless one is born of water, he's speaking singular. Uh, in verse uh, 3, he is, when he is saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he, the, they said the verb is, or the word you is singular. At the beginning of verse 7, do not marvel that I say to you, that is, I'm speaking to you individually. But then it switches to plural. You must be born again. So what he's saying, Nicodemus, this is just not for you. Even though I've been speaking to you, I've been talking to you individually, it's not just for you. People, you have to be born again. Tell the masses they have to be born again. This is for mankind. This is for uh, all humanity. You must be born again. Uh, and that's what we need to be telling the world today. They must be born again. They must come into a personal saving relationship with Christ Jesus. And then he ends up, he said, you know, faith is not believing in something that you can figure out and understand. Uh, I know in our world today, our scientists think they pinpoint a lot of stuff. But, you know, it. the verse 8, it says, The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And I think about the Hurricane Harvey. When we were down doing hurricane recovery in Texas, the wind came. It just came up out of the ocean, coming off, and all these things came together, formed it, and came. And they thought it was heading into the Yucatan Peninsula. And then less than 36 hours it, it made groundfall in Rockport, Texas, about 700 miles from where they thought it was going to make uh, landfall 36 hours before. Uh, I know the mayor down there, he was talking. He was an uh, ex-Air Force, uh, you know, retired Air Force colonel, spent time at the Pentagon and all, and said that he had a dear friend in the um, Noah Weather thing that called him up and said, you know, Mayor, uh, this thing has just made a shift. We don't know why, but it's just made a shift. And our tracking shows, and he knew where the mayor lived. He says, this thing's headed for your house. Uh, and uh, in the next 36 hours, he said, it came right over the top of my house. He said, they don't know why it made the shift. Don't know all the details in it. And that's the thing here we read. Jesus told him, says, you know, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear it sound. You don't know where it's coming from, where it goes. And he says, that's it. You don't have to understand all the details of being born again. It's not a physical thing. You're being born again by the Spirit of Christ Jesus, coming under his uh, leadership, under his uh, direction. And, and I'm thankful for that, that we don't have to understand everything. If we had to understand everything, a lot of us would be left out. You know, I, I tell people that, you know, my understanding is, is not the greatest. I read things, and as I read them, you know, and I tell you all every week, as I go through the study of the, what we're doing, and I, and I read it, and I pray about it, and I look at it, and God is showing me things. And I've been preaching since 1984. Uh, I have uh, been in the ministry a long time. In, uh, been in church since right after I was born. And uh, God is still showing me new things. He's still revealing things to me. He's still increasing my understanding. And if he allows my mind to stay with me, and uh, as long as I live, he, he will continue to increase my understanding because it is so impossible for us to truly understand the breadth, the depth, the height, everything of the love of God. We just can't understand it. Uh, all we do is just praise God for it, thank God for it, 
and love him for it, for the fact that he loved us, a people that truly are not, you know, we're not worthy, but he loves us anyway. So I thank the Lord for that. Church, it's good to be with you. Thank the Lord for you. I'm uh, going to miss being with you on Sunday. Lord willing, I'll uh, uh, do like so many people talk about doing me. I'll try to put Randy and Laura and everybody that's going to be up front on Sunday morning. I'll try to put you all up on the big screen on my TV and see what it looks like uh, seeing you all from that perspective. Uh, but uh, be praying for you. Uh, if you need me, give me a call. Um, and uh, I'll try my best to do what I can. Continue to pray for all of our people who have lost loved ones. For those of you, I'm sure most of y'all probably know, but if you haven't, don't know, uh, Shirley Everett's brother, Ed Cloniger, you know, passed away. And I think they're having his service at the uh, pavilion at the Grandview Cemetery tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, if, if I read it correctly. Pray for them. Talk to Miss Shirley. She's doing well. Uh, but uh, just pray that just God would just be with them in this time and just so many others. Uh, love you, church. Uh, join me as we pray. And uh, again, please pray for the uh, uh, food distribution, uh, the pantry opening on Saturday. Father, thank you. Thank you once again for loving us and taking care of us, Lord. Thank you once again for, Father, for just uh, the beautiful day. God, uh, if we sat down and just wrote down everything, Father, I know that for a while we were writing down every day all the things that we were thankful for. Father, it, God, we've got a book full and uh, still not enough to, to praise you and thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And Lord, I pray now tonight, Lord, that you just be with all of our folks. Lord, I pray that the word that's went out, God, would be a help. God, I know that I stumble and, and stammer around things at times, Lord, but God, your word does not return void, that it would accomplish that which you intended. And Father, I pray that uh, you would save some lost soul, God, that someone would understand what it means to be born again. And Father, I pray tonight for the church. I pray for the upcoming services. I pray for uh, those that have lost loved ones, that you just comfort them and bless them. And Lord, all these things we'd ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Love you, church. Thank the Lord for you. God bless you.